thank you to the organizers for this invitation to beautiful India and to this wonderful place. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is applications of uh, muons to study topological materials, or in particular, 3D topological insulators. Uh, but before I start, let me just thank all the people who are involved in this work, my collaborators at PSI, my colleagues, and especially my student Jonas Krieger, who's been working on, this, uh, on these systems. The samples came from Penn State University and from MIT, from the group of Professor Jagadish Mudera. Uh, some samples came also from PSI and from Oxford University, from Thurston Hesiedel, and then support from theory group in the DIPC in San Sebastian and in the MPI in Halle uh, in Germany. <clears throat> so the, the outline of my talk is the following. First, I'll give an introduction about topological uh, insulators. Then I'll present the experimental techniques that we use to study these systems because uh, I will show why we need low energy muons for this. And then I'll talk about the results. And I'll show a few examples of applications of low energy muons to uh, magnetically doped topological insulators, then interfaces, proximity between magnetic and topological insulator, and if I have time, I hope I'll have time, I'll talk about proximity between superconductor and topological insulator. So what is a 3D topological insulator? So a 3D topological insulator is an insulator in the bulk, but it has metallic surface states on its surface. But these metallic surface states are not trivial. What it means is that the wave function of these states, when you solve the Hamiltonian of the problem, have topological properties. For example, if you have a trivial insulator with surface states, it can have some surface states, but they're topologically trivial. In the case of topological insulator, they are spin polarized, meaning that if you have an electron moving in a certain direction, it has its spin locked transverse to its uh, linear momentum. And if it reverses orientation, it reverses orientation also of the spin. So they are spin polarized in nature. They're protected, meaning they cannot be destroyed by doping the sample or putting some uh, dislocations. Um, these metallic surface states, because they're topologically protected by time reverse symmetry, uh, they are temperature independent and they can, if, so they're ideal basically to be able to use them from temperature, from room temperature down to any temperature. It should not depend on temperature. So how can we use these topological surface states? And there are a few ways, there are many ways to use them, but I'm going to talk about a couple of examples where we see maybe future applications and some interest, uh, some fundamental physics interest. So one option is to do magnetic, magnetic topological insulators. And in this case, you're breaking time reversal symmetry. So if you apply an electric field on a topological insulator, you're breaking time reverse, reversal symmetry. And what happens when you break time reversal symmetry is that these Dirac-like dispersion electrons, when they, you, have them, you have them connected exactly at the Fermi energy in a normal state, when you have no field, when you apply a magnetic field, you open a gap between these two cones. And when you open a gap between these two cones, what happens is that you create a state where it's what, which is called quantum anomalous whole state. And in this case, you will have edge currents, edge states, which are perfectly spin polarized. So one can think about using such system to uh, create spin polarized currents, for example, in the future. The other thing that you can do when you have such a system is that you have what we call topological magnetoelectric effect. And in this case, there is a, when you apply a magnetic field on the sample, you create an electric field in it. And if you apply an electric field on the sample, you will create a magnetic field on it. 
So you can think about manipulating these kinds of systems by applying electric field or magnetic field and sensing the other field in uh, memory applications or anything like that. And there are some um, predictions, some theoretical predictions, for example, to create an image monopole. And this is the confusion that happened. So for that, I have a poster, which you can see if you're interested in this subject. Now, what happens when we have a superconductivity in a topological insulator, when we in induce superconductivity in a topological insulator, what we expect from theory point of view is that we create some non-conventional superconductivity. It's called spin triplet superconductivity. And in this case, if you put the system, for example, if you put a normal S-wave superconductor, typical superconductor, and you cover it with a topological insulator, and you produce vortices, magnetic vortices, in the system in the vortex state, what happens is that in these vortices, you will have what we call, what we call Majorana fermions. And these Majorana fermions are excitations, they're zero energy excitations, but there's the hope of using them, using them for quantum computation as quantum objects that you can do quantum computers with. And there are two ways to create the superconductivity. One option is by doping, transition metal into a topological insulator, for example, bismuth selenite. By doping in, uh, or intercalating copper, you make it superconducting, or by simply putting a sandwich of a topological insulator with a superconductor. So all these systems that I've been talking about have been produced in thin films. You cannot have them as crystals. And that makes it harder to look at their superconducting and magnetic properties in conventional MUSR, for example, or any other technique for that matter. So for this, we have two special, specialized techniques to study interfaces and thin films at PSI. The main one that I'm going to be talking about is low energy muons and results from low energy, low energy muons. But there's another technique that we use uh, using soft x-rays, we do ARPES using soft x-rays. So typically ARPES is done with low energy uh, photons. And in this case, you use high energy for a, a reason that I'll explain in a, in a next slide. So we use the information that we get from low, from low energy muons to look at the magnetic and superconducting properties of these thin films. And we look at the electronic properties of the system using the soft X-ray ARPES. So Steve has already shown you what MUSR does and what can do and how it's done. And um, I'll just tell you a little bit about what we do with low-energy muons. So with low-energy muons, we use the same muons that we use for bulk measurements. But what we do is that we first stop them. We stop them in the argon gas, and maybe Thomas will talk a little bit more about that. And then we re-accelerate them from mega electron volts. We re-accelerate them, uh, so we stop them from mega electron volts, and then we re-accelerate them re to a range of kilo electron volt energies where they stop at, at nanometer depth scales. So here I have a plot of for an example, topological insulator on sapphire with tellurium, tellurium capping. And in this case, if you go to one kilo electron volt, for example, energy of the muons, you stop most of the muons in the TI itself. If you go slightly higher energy, you start pushing more and more muons, stopping near the interface. And this way you can, by increasing the energy, do a depth resolved measurement of your polarization. And this is basically the main idea of low energy muons. So we take the conventional muons and make them more suitable for thin films. Um, soft X-ray ARPES, it just by using soft X-rays, we have escaped depth of uh, photoelectrons from deep into the sample. So instead of having ARPES, which looks only at the surface, the top angstroms, we can go down to two nanometers with this case. Basically, by shooting uh, elect uh, photons, which are on a resonance, X-ray resonance of atomic species in the system. So it has elemental sensitivity also. 
Okay, let me go into the results directly. So I'll start by looking at magnetically doped topological insulators, which have been actually used to observe quantum anomalous Hall effect in these systems. And the systems that have been used are chromium and antimony do and vanadium doped antimony bismuth telluride topological insulators. Now, the problem with this, uh, with seeing this quantum anomalous Hall effect is that first of all, the typical transition temperature of these vanadium and chromium doped uh, topological insulator is about 100 Kelvin. So ideally, once you go below this transition, you should observe the quantum anomalous Hall effect because you have an internal field which uh, breaks time reversal symmetry. But in fact, what we see in experiment is that it's only observed below 100 millikelvin. So you have to go many orders of magnitude below the transition temperature to see a quantum anomalous Hall effect, which is quite surprising and was not understood. So the question is really why? And obviously, these systems, because they are thin films, nobody knew what the magnetic properties were of these systems. So we try to look at that using low energy muons. And what we do, for example, at room temperature, the system is paramagnetic. We shoot muons in with a small applied field transverse to the sample. And we see nice oscillating signal with no damping. Looks very nice. As we lower the temperature, we go below the transition temperature, which is in this case, uh, for this doping, it's about 150 Kelvin. You start seeing that the oscillation amplitude is lower. And you go to lower temperature and there is more oscillating, the oscillating amplitude is even lower. And you see also slightly higher damping in the signal. This signal is not coming, in this measurement, what we call weak transfer field measurement, in the paramagnetic state, you put the muons and it sees a uniform zero or applied magnetic field in the sample. But as the magnetic order starts happening, the magnetic order seems to happen in parts of the volume of the sample, but not across the whole sample at once. Okay? So this, the fact that we start seeing a drop in the asymmetry and oscillating asymmetry tells us that there is inhomogeneity in the field that happens in samples. In the regions which, where you have large magnetic fields where the magnetic order has happened, you lose the polarization in this case. There is a very fast decay of the polarization. What's left is only the regions where the fields are still small and there is no magnetic order. So if we look at these asymmetries as a function of temperature in all these dopings that we looked at, you can see this yellow doping is the one that I, I showed you earlier, 19%. Uh, and there's a drop below 150 Kelvin. The asymmetry starts dropping. So this essentially is the, in this case, it's the normalized asymmetry to the room temperature value, which tells me what is the magnetic volume fraction. This drop in the asymmetry is the magnetic volume fraction of my sample. And we can see that as you lower the doping, the magnetic volume fraction still goes to almost full magnetic. But as we go to the samples where we, they see, actually this sample has been used to observe quantum anomalous Hall effect, it's not fully magnetic even. It's only half magnetic. So actually, the reason that they need to go to such low temperature is that this magnetism is not really uniform. So this is really normalized magnetic volume fraction as a function of temperature for all these samples. And again, it shows that only 50 to 70% of the quantum anomalous hole systems become magnetic at low temperature. So what we know also is that this magnetism happens in homogeneous, so you have clusters or islands of magnetism embedded in this topological insulator uh, in general. So let me just show you one example of what we do with uh, soft X-ray ARPES. So this is an example on the vanadium doped sample, and we look at the absorption of the X-rays as a function of energy, and we see the resonant absorption of 
uh, vanadium. So if you want to see the contribution of vanadium to your band structure, what you do is that you measure on resonance where the absorption is high in the vanadium, and you measure off resonance where the absorption is low of the vanadium. And then you sub subtract the two. And what you get is something which is proportional to the contribution of the vanadium to the band structure. And what was surprising to us is that we see some high intensity and a non-dispersive band <coughs> exactly at zero energy, at the Fermi energy. Which means you're doping vanadium and you're making the sample conducting. These vanadium are producing conduction electrons. So conduction electrons are ruining the, the, the insulating properties of this topological insulator. So these two factors, the fact that we have a not fully magnetic uh, volume fraction and that we have uh, an impurity band in these samples are probably the reason that you need to go to such low temperature to observe the quantum anomalous Hall effect. So this is the first part. Let me now move on to talking about uh, a magnetic proximity between europium sulfide and topological insulator bismuth selenide. And this sample was quite interesting when it appeared, uh, or this system was quite interesting when it appeared, because they found that it's magnetic up to room temperature. At least that was the claim from polarized neutron uh, reflectometry when they measured it. And that was published recently in Nature. And then they sent us the sample to have a look at it. And this prediction that they saw, the observation that they saw magnetism up to room temperature was actually contradicting all theoretical calculations that has been done on these interfaces. So what we decide to do is take to see if this is really because of topological properties of topological insulator. So we took two samples. One was just the capping of aluminum oxide on europium sulfide in topological insulator, so the topological sample. And one with trivial titanium metal instead of topological insulator. So a trivial metal and a topological insulator. And we try to measure both of them. So what we see here, again, we can see that there, are, there is some magnetism happening. If we look, for example, at different depths uh, as a function, this is as a function of depth. This is the fraction of muons stopping in the middle layer. And this is the fraction stopping in the substrate. As we increase the energy, we stop more muons in the substrate. But around the two kilo electron volts, we're primarily stopping in the topological insulator uh, layer, which we want. And you can see that below 5 Kelvin, there's a big drop in the asymmetry because of the magnetism. So we can really see the magnetism of the europium sulfide, which has TC about 17 Kelvin. If we compare it to titanium, there's the same behavior, similar behavior. At low temperature, again, there's a loss in asymmetry the same way, at the same depth, because the stopping of the muons is similar in both cases. So the number of muons stopping in each layer at a certain energy is similar in both samples. So everything looking good and fine. Now we start looking at uh, how big is the step. Let me just go first here. So we want to see what is the contribution to this drop from europium sulfide alone. So what we did, we had a sample of this vanadium doped bis bismuth and telluride sample, which has a transition temperature at 150 Kelvin, so very high transition temperature. And then it has europium sulfide on top of it. And what we see, the asymmetry starts dropping here at 150 Kelvin, as we saw earlier. And then at 17 Kelvin, there's another drop. This other drop is because of europium sulfide. This one, I remind you, was totally magnetic at this temperature. And then if we compare it to a europium sulfide on bismuth selenide, we see that there is no drop, but suddenly there's a big drop, much bigger than what europium sulfide should give us. So obviously there is magnetism being transferred into the topological insulator. But how much and how deep? So then we try to look at our simulated stopping distributions and see how many muons stop in layers below the europium sulfide. 
and assume that each layer here, if we, for example, assume that one layer only here is losing, is magnetic, then what we get is this black line. If we increase one nanometer, we get this red line. So as we increase, we get more and more. And you can see that if we look at the experimental results compared to the theoretical prediction or the calculated prediction, we see that it goes up to about eight nanometers, six to eight nanometers into the topological insulator. But also, this is the topological insulator and this is titanium. There is practically no difference between them. In both cases, it's about six to eight nanometers. So now, did this europium sulfide ruin the band structure of the topological insulator? And this is something that we can do with soft x-rays. And we can see that the electronic structure is very similar to what we expect. These are basically, the resolution is not very good with soft x-rays, but we can see that the band structure looks basically the same like a bare bismuth cell line. So there is no change to the band electronic structure. Now let's compare and answer the question, the first question that we started with. If we look at the titanium or the topological insulator, both thick topological insulator or thin topological insulator, we see that the normalized asymmetry looks exactly the same. There is no difference whatsoever between them. So whatever magnetism we see transferred into the under layer is basically has nothing to do with topology. We do, however, see that there's a drop starting from room temperature in the asymmetry. So there is possibly some magnetism happening really near the interface and going up to very high temperatures. But this is only within one nanometer from the, in, from the interface. Okay, let me, is, is it? Still have 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So let me go back, go to the last example of these systems and it's a system where we have a topological insulator grown on top of superconducting niobium. So in this case, we have a simple, a simple film, which is uh, 80 nanometers bismuth selenide grown on top of 100 nanometers of niobium and on a substrate of sapphire. This is what we expect as we increase the energy, we're stopping only in the bismuth cell night, we increase more and more and we start getting closer to the interface and then we can even go very deep into the niobium. So we can study the system from the top, from the surface, all the way into the superconductor. If we look as a function of temperature, uh, at high temperatures, above the transition temperature, superconducting transition temperature of niobium, which is around eight Kelvin, we see a nice slowly damped oscillating signal. If we go below the transition temperature, if you look hard, you will see that there is a shift in the frequency change in the magnetic field in the niobium, and there's also an increased damping. So what we're probing here, if I lay, take this, this spectra and I Fourier transform them, I'm probing the uh, field distribution in the sample at this depth, 22 kilo electron volt, which is deep into the niobium. And if I look at the average magnetic field as a function of temperature deep into the niobium, I'll see what we call the Meissner effect. So below the transition, above the transition, we have the applied field and we have frequency that reflects the applied field. As we go below the transition, we start seeing a big drop in the frequency of the precession, which means that the magnetic field in the niobium is smaller than the applied field, as you would expect, because the superconductor repels the magnetic field in it. And if we go and implant muons in the bismuth selenide in the top layer, what we see is that there is no change and there's a slight increase below the superconducting transition quite surprising. If there is a superconductivity transferred into the bismuth cell night, we should see also some Meissner screening. All the superconductors that we know in bulk do Meissner screening. So the question is why? 
Here I'm showing you a comparison. For example, this is aluminum on niobium. You see Meissner screening. So superconductivity transferred from niobium into aluminum. And you see Meissner screening weaker, but there is still some Meissner screening until you go very far away from the interface. This is trivial metal. Topological insulator, we have above the transition, no shift. Below the transition, there is a shift from negative to positive in the bismuth cell line. So clearly very different behavior from what we expect in standard superconductor. And one possible explanation for this, which was predicted also theoretically, is that we have an odd frequency superconductor. I'm not going to go into the details, but the idea is that the wave function of the Cooper pairs can be uh, odd frequency, symmetric under particle exchange. Uh, so in the case that it's asymmetric under particle exchange, this is the odd frequency order that we're talking about. But this order does not exist in bulk superconductors. And it was predicted that it should happen with topological insulators. So instead, this, what, uh, what this odd frequency superconductivity does is that instead of repelling the magnetic field, it actually pulls it in, into the superconductor. So it has an inverse Meissner screening, if you want. But there are some problems with this explanation. And one problem is that, first of all, we know that these topological insulators uh, have some charge carriers. They're not true insulators. They're more like semiconductors. So there is some contribution from conduction electrons in the bulk. And that means that there, is, there should be two effects. These uh, bulk electrons should produce the normal Meissner uh, screening, meaning should, be, should produce normal superconductivity as we expect, and only the surface states should produce this odd frequency. So there are two canceling effects, and we need to work on improving our bismuth cell line, maybe to enhance this effect even more. So there are various theories that try to explain this, but none of them is actually working in our system. And we are trying to collaborate with some theoreticians to do calculations for this exact system with the addition uh, of bulk conduction bands and so on uh, that to consider and calculate the experimental uh, situation. So to summarize, the absence of quantum anomalous hole effect in uh, antimony telluride at high temperatures is probably due to a partial magnetic volume fraction and an impurity band at the Fermi energy. In the case of European sulfide topological insulator, uh, we see that there is probably no contribution to topological properties of the system to this proximity effect that we see. And finally, in a superconductivity, we see hints of odd frequency superconductivity in the interface topological insulator with a superconductor. And thank you for your attention.